The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of Your Included, theologian Dr. George Hunzinger discusses his work examining the theology of the Eucharist in different Christian heritages. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for being with us. Well, I'm glad to be here again. Thank you. I'd like to talk about a couple of terms that uh, our viewers are no doubt familiar with, but maybe you could uh, define them and then move on to a third term that you put forward in your book, uh, The Eucharist and Ecumenism. I'm sure most of our viewers are familiar with transubstantiation and consubstantiation and that there's been controversy, but they may not remember what the controversy was and what the definitions are. And you introduced the concept of, of uh, trans-elementation. And so could you describe those and move on to trans-elementation and the potential you see for the use of that term? Yes, thank you. Uh, there are three main issues that need to be addressed if we are to get beyond the impasse in ecumenical discussion about the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Uh, one has to do with the real presence of Christ. That's where your question uh, about those terms comes in. Then there's the question of Eucharistic sacrifice. And finally, there's the question of the ordained ministry, and I try to address all three of those areas in my book. But uh, the churches have divided uh, historically over the question about how are we to understand the idea of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. And it has to be given uh, a rather specialized uh, form, uh, formulation of just what's at stake. Uh, it can't just be that Christ is somehow really present in the Lord's Supper. It has to do with uh, the bread and the wine as consecrated elements, and in what sense are the body and blood of Christ present uh, in and through and with uh, the elements of bread and wine? So the, the historic Roman Catholic answer to that uh, is uh, transubstantiation. And this is uh, now a term that has been defined by a church council for them. The Council of Trent gave a technical definition to transubstantiation. So that's the one we have to look at. The word was around much longer than that, but it didn't have a technical definition prior to the 16th century. So the Reformation uh, forced the Catholic Church to uh, come up with a, a more careful definition of what they meant than had been true previously, and that then divided the Protestant churches from the Roman Catholic Church. And what the Council of Trent did was to draw uh, largely upon the definition that Thomas Aquinas had developed uh, in the 13th century. Transubstantiation uh, involves conversion and containment. Uh, the bread and the wine are somehow converted so that they become the body and blood of Christ in a particular form, and the body and blood uh, are then contained in the bread and the wine, uh, respectively. So transubstantiation is, uh, in a sense, a theory of descent and uh, containment. You know, the, the grace of God uh, descends from heaven, and when the priest presiding at the Eucharist or the bishop says the words of consecration, the words that Jesus is recorded as having said at the Last Supper, this is my body given for you, uh, this cup in the New Testament is my blood uh, shed for you. Uh, when the priest says that in the Catholic liturgy, a bell is rung, uh, because it, uh, that's where you're really supposed to pay attention. That's where the uh, miracle and the wonder takes place that the bread is no longer merely bread, the wine is no longer merely wine, but is the uh, body and blood of Christ. But, but the outward form, called the accidents, 
remains. So uh, this distinction that comes from Aristotle about uh, substance and accidents was used uh, by Aquinas, and the, the Council of Trent changed it just slightly. Instead of talking about accidents, they used the word species, but it was all the same thing. It's kind of form and content. The outward form remains the form of bread, and the outward form remains the form of wine. But the inner content, the inner substance, has been converted and transformed into the body and blood of Christ, which are then contained by the elements. Uh, the Reformation felt that this was really a terrible idea and it made no sense, so they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Whether they had uh, a really suitable alternative or not is uh, another matter. But the Lutherans and uh, the Reformed within the Reformation split apart over this question. Uh, in the first generation of Reformers, the Reformed were from Switzerland and southern Germany, but especially Switzerland, were led by the Zurich reformer uh, Ulrich Swingli. And the Lutherans, of course, were led by Martin Luther uh, from uh, Wittenberg. And Swingli had what is thought of as a very low understanding of how the bread and the wine function in the Lord's Supper. They, they are merely symbols of something that... Uh, is not necessarily present. I mean, there, there's more than one way to kind of work this out. I won't go into the details. But basically, you know, what happened in the past, you know, in Christ's uh, once-for-all saving work, that that is symbolized and remembered in uh, the Lord's Supper. That was Swingley's basic view. But what the, uh, the Reformed tradition was especially concerned to protect was the integrity of Christ's human body after his resurrection and ascension. So they thought if, if Christ was somehow substantially present in the Lord's Supper, it was impossible to maintain the full integrity of his human body in heaven. Uh, <clears throat> and even Calvin, who modified Swingley's views quite uh, considerably, still had that as a primary concern. And the, and one reason they had that idea, was that, that conviction, was that they believed salvation was at stake. If Jesus' humanity ceased to be real humanity in its full integrity uh, as a human body, uh, uh, as a part of his humanity, then uh, uh, the very idea of our salvation was uh, destroyed. I mean, he had to remain uh, a real human being uh, even uh, after the ascension. The Lutheran view is sometimes called consubstantiation. It's a term you mentioned. And some Lutherans are okay with that term, but some aren't. Uh, there are Lutheran documents uh, from the 16th and 17th century that deny that this describes the Lutheran position. And there are others uh, uh, who still use the term. And Partly it's a matter of definitions. A consubstantiation can mean more than one thing. But if it means that you just have two substances together, uh, the, the, the substance of the bread and the substance of the body of Christ, whatever substance means, I mean, even for Catholics, this whole substance accidents scheme uh, is kind of perplexing today. I mean, nobody quite knows what to make of these Aristotelian terms. But uh, there is a view, uh, a kind of a dictionary definition view of consubstantiation, which just has the two substances coexisting together. So the bread remains bread, but the body of Christ is joined to it somehow, mysteriously. And maybe it's not taken any further, but it, you, you get the impression sometimes that they're externally related. You know, they're, they're just sort of coexisting side by side. Now, I don't think that was Luther's view, but it is a view that is ascribed to Lutheranism and is accepted by some Lutherans. Luther uh, actually, at his best, I mean, he's said different things in different writings. He's actually not an easy theologian to pin down because he's so situational. 
uh, and he'll say one thing here and another thing there, and you know, it's like a bell-shaped curve in the end uh, with one or two standard deviations. But in his great treatise of 1520 called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, one of his most widely read uh, uh, treatises, he takes a position that was somewhat neglected or, or put to one side in the heat of reformational controversies you know, between Luther and Zwingli and others uh, of their uh, colleagues. But in Babylonian captivity, Luther focuses on the verse 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and that verse says, the bread that we break, is it not a blank in the body of Christ? Well, in English, the word that I've left blank is often translated as participation. But Luther, of course, knew it in the Greek. The Greek word is koinonia. So uh, one way of interpreting the verse, and there's more than one way, one way of interpreting the verse is to say that the relationship between the bread that we break and the body of Christ is a koinonia relation. It's some kind of participation of the one in the other. The idea of participation is not always kept in mind when the term consubstantiation is used. But consubstantiation can be used to cover this other case where there's a more intimate a kind of um, indwelling, at least of the bre uh, body in the bread. The, the uh, Eastern Orthodox view that I have found uh, to be so helpful as a way of moving beyond the impasse ecumenically, uh, it's not called consubstantiation by them, but Luther's view in the Babylonian captivity of the church, based on 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and other verses, is not far from that ancient Orthodox view. The Orthodox have a number of different terms that they will use, and it actually makes it hard to find out what they actually think. But if you read around long enough, as I did, you can see that uh, there's one term that stands out among the rest, uh, and that is what I put forth in my book as trans-elementation, metastoichiosis. But it's really just an interpretation, uh, a deep one, of 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Uh, so what is a koinonia relation? Well, there's more than one way to, to work that out, too. But it can be a relationship of mutual indwelling. And if you take that view, then the bread can remain bread without any loss of its definition as bread. I mean, it's not substance and accidents. The bread remains bread. And it somehow participates in the body of Christ. It's not just that the body of Christ participates in the bread, but there's uh, a relationship of each being in the other. Uh, and, uh, of, of course, for the Catholics and for the Orthodox and for this view that Luther espoused, it's not just the body and blood of Christ that are thought of uh, in detachment from the rest of his person. It's just this is the form in which he's present to us, this sacrificial form, you know, in and with uh, the sacramental form of his body and blood, the whole person of Christ is really present. But he offers himself to us under the sacramental form of his body and blood. Uh, he gives himself to the church in that form, and in the same way he unites the church to himself. So uh, as in the incarnation, he assumed uh, human flesh. Uh, he made himself one with us. Uh, even though he was God, he emptied himself and took the form of a servant, uh, even to death on a cross, as we read in Philippians. He took that flesh. He made himself one with us in order to bear our sins and bear them away, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He also makes us one with himself through that very same body and blood, that very same sacrificial death. There's only one body of Christ. It, it uh, is definitively present uh, in Christ's life and death there and then, but
but then it becomes sacramentally present. It's thought here and now under the forms of bread and wine. Well, the image that was used in the ancient church to bring out this idea of trans-elementation was the image of the iron in the fire. And they used that image both for the incarnation and for uh, the relationship between uh, the bread and the wine and Christ's life-giving flesh. And there's a kind of incarnational analogy here, which uh, is uh, important. Uh, and in the uh, council uh, decision at Chalcedon in 451, the 5th century decision defining the person of Christ, and this is uh, a decision that's definitive for Catholics, for Orthodox, and for Reformation Protestants. Uh, they had to try to give some account of how uh, Christ's deity and humanity were related. And they said that they were related without separation or division. So that meant there was, uh, to put it more positively, uh, an inseparable unity between them. And then without confusion or change, the deity of Christ in the union remained deity, the humanity of Christ in the union remained humanity. So it's a very mysterious thing. How can they uh, uh, be together in one person? That's the mystery of the incarnation. You know, if God by nature is immortal, how can the immortal God assume mortal flesh? You know, the, the questions like that. that. That's the mystery of the incarnation. And then I think there's a third element here that's implied, a, a kind of asymmetry. I mean, deity and humanity are not on a par with one another. I mean, they, they wouldn't balance the scales if you could put them on some kind of scales. Uh, none of these images would be perfect. And let me use another one for a moment that uh, has real limitations, but uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, the great Cappadocian theologian uh, from the uh, uh, fourth century, said that deity and humanity in Christ were something like a drop of water and the ocean. So, I mean, the deity of Christ has this immensity to it, and you know, the humanity has a kind of uh, a smallness and, and uh, uh, relative to his deity, uh, a kind of insignificance. I mean, the problem with that image, of course, is that it loses the, the idea of uh, without confusion or change. You know, if you put the drop of water into the ocean, it disappears. Uh, but in terms of the scale that we're talking about, the incommensurability, the absolute difference between deity and humanity, it kind of helps us to imagine that. So, so we need uh, three things to think about the person of Christ. And this carries over by analogy to thinking about the bread and the wine. You need asymmetry. You, you need uh, the priority of the, the one over the other. You need uh, unity. You need a kind of inseparable unity of these two that would not otherwise come together except for the miracle of grace. And in that unity, you need an abiding distinction. Well, th this, this is the model that the Orthodox have used. We're thinking not only about the incarnation, which is true of all Nicene Christians and Chalcedonian Christians, but they, they use this incarnational analogy to think about how Christ's life-giving flesh is related to the Eucharistic gifts of, of bread and wine, without separation or division, without confusion or change, so unity, distinction, and, see, this is what's missing now from uh, transubstantiation this element of asymmetry, which gives the, the precedence uh, to Christ and his body. It's not just that the body is contained in the bread, it's that Christ, in the power of the Spirit, takes these Eucharistic gifts and joins himself to them in a certain respect, so that he himself, not the priest, is the acting subject in uh, the working of this uh, uh, sacramental miracle in order to offer himself uh, through the priest to the people in these sacramental forms. So transelementation 
involves uh, an explicit place also for the work of the Holy Spirit. The Orthodox have this wonderful idea in the Greek, it's called epiclesis, which means invocation. The Spirit is invoked in the course of celebrating the Eucharistic uh, liturgy. But the Orthodox don't pin it down to a particular moment in, in, the, in the liturgy itself. There's no bell that is rung when uh, the transformation takes place. In a sense, the whole liturgy is one long epiclesis, one long invocation of the Spirit. And the Spirit is thought to take the bread and the wine into the presence of Christ, who then joins himself to the elements and offers himself uh, in a sacramental form uh, through the bread and the wine to uh, the faithful. So the bread remains bread, and the body of Christ remains the body of Christ. But that iron and the fire image is something like that Chalcedonian pattern that I was laying out. I mean, it, it's an impersonal image. It has its limits. But the iron remains iron. It doesn't cease to be iron. It doesn't lose anything of it. what defines it as iron. It doesn't lose its substance. Uh, the fire remains fire. And yet the two become one. You know, as long as the iron is in the fire, uh, there's this inseparable unity. So there's an abiding distinction and an inseparable unity. And you know, if you push the analogy a little bit, there's also that asymmetry. There's a way in which the iron is in the fire in a different sense than the fire is in the iron because there's more to the fire. If you think of a campfire uh, situation than uh, the iron itself, so. Uh, you get that sense of something larger entering into the iron, you know, the fire being like the deity or being like uh, the glorified body of Christ joining itself to this more ordinary element, as it were, of, of Christ's flesh in the incarnation or the bread and the wine in the Eucharist. So, so the image that illustrates this mutual indwelling uh, in the idea of transelementation is the image of the iron in the fire. Well, it turns out that not only did Luther essentially have this idea without making it as explicit as I'm making, but he, he actually had the image of iron in the fire. And I don't know where he got it, but he, he maybe just got it from reading ancient theology. Uh, see, the Orthodox are out of the picture. The, the, the church split apart uh, in the 11th century, uh, and the East and West had gone their separate ways. And I, I think one of the reasons things polarized so badly uh, in the West is because the Orthodox were absent. They didn't have a voice at the table. And they managed to hold some things together that uh, uh, entered into uh, uh, you know, one of those either-ors, you know, one of those false uh, uh, decisions that uh, have, have characterized Eucharistic controversy in the West. But there were some Protestant reformers, not just Luther, who essentially knew about this idea, and for my purposes, the important thing uh, in my book is not that they took this idea of the iron in the fire or the idea of transelementation and made it central to what they wanted to teach about uh, the Lord's Supper, but they knew about it and they didn't reject it. They didn't see anything problematic uh, with it. So, that's all I need in order to uh, make my argument that we need to take every step we can toward achieving uh, uh, unity in the church around these divisive issues, as long as it doesn't involve us in theological compromise. So here's a view that's different from the Roman Catholic view, but that the Roman Catholics don't reject. The Roman Catholics at, at Vatican II the official church council in the 1960s, called by Pope John XXIII, decided that from the Catholic side, there's no reason not to enter into uh, Eucharistic fellowship with the Orthodox. The Orthodox don't, uh, as a rule, subscribe to the technical uh, definition of transubstantiation that is official Roman Catholic teaching. They have the iron and the fire idea, transelementation, and there were Reformed theologians, not just Lutherans, who knew of this image and knew of this idea and talked about it, sometimes used it in argument, they didn't reject it. They didn't see anything problematic with it. 
the, the, the important figure, he's not very well known, but uh, his name is Peter Martyr Fermili. He was a close associate of John Calvin's. In fact, he's one of the few reformers with whom, I, as far as I know, Calvin never entered into any serious disagreement. So that they uh, were not uh, in the same place at the same time. They, they just uh, had a correspondence. Calvin said at one point, nobody has a better understanding of the Lord's Supper than Peter Martyr Fermili. And it was Fermili who discovered this idea of transelementation, which is how I learned about it. I learned about it through reading Fermili, but I didn't know what it was until I was able to connect it with the image of the iron and the fire. Uh, but Fermili found it in an Eastern Orthodox theologian dating back to the 11th century, because uh, in those days, uh, it was important to be able to show, the, the, re, the reformers wanted to show that their ideas were not coming out of nowhere, that they had uh, backing in the tradition. You know, the patristic theologians often said things, or, or the theologians in the tradition said things they wanted to say, too. The, the Catholics were the ones that had gone off the rails, and the reformers were recovering the authentic tradition. So Fermili, uh, more than any of them, because he wasn't uh, a reformer who had a city and a, a church to superintend, he was a scholar, he, uh, this is sort of my supposition. He, he had time to go digging around in the library. And uh, we now have uh, a fair number of his writings in English just in the last decade or so because there's a whole Fermili industry that has sprung up uh, centered in Orlando, Florida, and all these people are busily translating Fermili and, and putting his works out there. And, and one of them is called the Oxford Disputation on the Eucharist. So Fermili is debating this very high-powered Roman Catholic theologian, and he needs all the ammunition he can find. So he, I, as I imagine him having the time that you know, Calvin didn't have, or that Martin Bootser didn't have, or that even Thomas Cranmer in England didn't have, uh, to, to find out about these precedents. And he's the one who uh, gave this term transelementation prominence. But then it it shows up in the most important, the most lengthy and important writing on the Lord's Supper written by Thomas Cranmer. And people have had trouble figuring out where does Cranmer finally come down? You know, some people think he's very close to Zwingli, which would give him a low view. Uh, others try to see him in a different light. In, in this treatise that Tr Cranmer wrote, there's about a page where he's discussing the same figure that I think it was Fermili who must have discovered. This is another, this again, it's, it's sort of one, it's an enigma wrapped in a mystery again and again. This guy I had never heard of named Theophilac from the 11th century. Uh, I eventually found out he was a very distinguished theologian, kind of on a par with Anselm in the West. Uh, he became the Archbishop of Bulgaria and was kind of in exile there. He was constantly longing for the society and the theological conversations and the libraries of Constantinople, but his bishop made him go to Bulgaria, so he lived out his days in Bulgaria. He wrote commentaries on Scripture. Fermili found Theophilac. In Theophilac, he found the term transelementation, so he used it, and he didn't know that it went all the way back to Gregory of Nazianzen and Cyril of Alexandria, and the, the most seminal and important patristic theologians on the Greek-speaking side of things. So it has a, a heritage, a lineage, that even the Reformers didn't appreciate when they embraced this idea. But here's Cranmer writing this treatise, which some people think is basically Zwingli, but he comes to Theophilac. He, he has Theophilac by name. He has the image of the iron in the fire. He says uh, you know, the, the bread and the wine uh, really become infused with the body and blood of Christ so that they are the presence of the body and blood of Christ in sacramental form. Th this might look like transubstantiation, says Cranmer. It isn't. Uh, it might look like a problem, but it isn't, he says. And then uh, Calvin's mentor, Martin Bootser, also, interestingly, has the term transelementation. So here's Fermili, Cranmer, and Bootser 
each of whom is making use of this idea that has its roots in the Greek church and in Greek-speaking theologians that go all the way back to uh, a very ancient times, and they don't find anything wrong with it. And there's even one little passage in Calvin's Institutes, not very explicit. I mean, it doesn't have the image of the iron and the fire. And uh, it's, it's an overlooked passage. But Calvin says, the ancients, every, every time I read that uh, until I started working on this book, I thought he must mean the Latin theologians. But I think he means the Greeks. The ancients had the idea that the bread and the wine are elevated into a different domain. This is, I'm being a little more explicit than Calvin was. Uh, so that they don't cease to become bread and wine, but they're converted. He, he does have the idea of conversion. They're converted into the body and blood of Christ. Again, this is not an idea that Calvin does anything with, but he says explicitly, of this to this, we have no objection. So, insofar as this Eastern Orthodox understanding was known by the Protestant reformers, it was embraced in various ways and certainly not rejected. Well, I think this is a way that we could reach convergence on this historically divisive issue. And actually, uh, I, I find it to be a very deep and a very rich idea that uh, Christ's body and blood, without ceasing to be uh, definitive in their historical enactment in his life and death on earth, can assume a sacramental form. And it means that Christ is not separable from his saving significance or from his work and benefits. If he's present, his work is present. His benefits are present, and in the Lord's Supper, they're present in this uh, unique and uh, miraculous way that the bread and the wine, without ceasing to be bread and wine, come to uh, enter into an inseparable unity with his body and blood so that he gives himself to us under the forms of uh, bread and wine. Uh, George Herbert, the 17th century uh, Anglican minister and poet uh, has a, a, a line that says, love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood and I as wine. I, I, I think that's compatible with the idea of transelementation. So it's, it's not descent and replacement, which is what you get in trans element, uh, transubstantiation. It's elevation and enhancement. You know, the, the bread and the wine are enhanced by being joined into a kind of mystical union with the body and blood of Christ. And, you know, it's very odd to do all this focusing on the elements and so on, uh, but it's necessary because that's where the divisions have arisen. But the mystical union of Christ with the bread and the wine becomes the means by which we enter into mystical union with Christ. You know, he gives himself to us and we enter into union with him through his self-offering under the forms of bread and wine, which are really the sacramental forms of his body and blood. So that, that's roughly the way I try to work things out in that part of my book. And I don't see any losses here for the Reformation churches. There's no compromise. You know, none of the reformers, I mean, I could say in principle, there's no compromise and make a case, but I don't even have to do that all by myself. I've got Fermili and Cranmer and Bootser essentially doing the same thing. And maybe Calvin, you know, I mean, uh, he does, he's not explicit enough for me to rely too heavily on him. But uh, here, here's a very promising idea that could help get us uh, beyond this impasse around how to think about the real presence of Christ. There's a non-church-dividing alternative to the Roman Catholic view that is not church-dividing from a Catholic standpoint. This is part of a more general strategy in my book. There are often places where the Orthodox don't agree with the Catholics that are more congenial to the Reformation. And insofar as we can move 
uh, closer to the Orthodox and kind of go on their coattails, so to speak. Because remember, we Protestants are little slivers in that big pie that comprises world Christianity. And Catholics are 50%, and Orthodox are 17 or, or so percent. I mean, that's a big chunk. I mean, there are other questions that I wouldn't think would need to be uh, considered so uh, uh, intensively if they weren't important to the Catholics and the Orthodox. But if they think they're important, and if we're striving for church unity, then we have to make a good faith effort to try to find a way that we can approximate what they're calling for without compromise. And, and what I found in my uh, argument was, at every point, as far as I can see, it leads to an enrichment for Protestants and not losses, which is what the Reformers always feared, that if we came too close to the Catholics and they didn't know much about the Orthodox, uh, it, it would just be compromise and loss. Well, there's another way of trying to work this out that doesn't lead to losses. In fact, we're recovering elements of the ancient tradition which would only be uh, to our well-being and the well-being of world Christianity. Have, do you see progress along these lines actually being made uh, yet? Well, nobody has yet really come to terms with the argument I make I in my book because it's, it's too new. Uh, by and large, Catholic reviewers have been favorable. Uh, Orthodox, you know, being Orthodox, you know, they're not going to embrace it with open arms, but they're not hostile. As a kind of parallel movement that I don't engage with very much, but that I, I need to give some more thought to now that I've gotten things to this point in my own mind with the book, we need to think about, okay, let, let's say you want to do something with this idea of transelementation. Well, you'd have to figure out what kind of language you would want to incorporate into your worship. How, how would you express that? What, what difference would it make liturgically? I mean, actually, this can be incorporated without anything terribly extensive or elaborate. You don't need the kind of arguments. You don't need the kind of explanations that I need to give to sort of back it up at a theological level. But at, on this parallel track of thinking about liturgy and the language of worship, yes, progress is being made. And insofar as a theologian can give good reasons for why this liturgical progress should continue, that's where it finally has its payoff. How, do, how does it show up in the language of worship? The average Christian who comes to the Lord's ta table and, and partakes of the Lord's Supper knows nothing of all, the, or if anything, very little about all this kind of discussion and meaning and all that. All they know is that uh, this is what Christians do, mm -hmm. and so they do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the hierarchy and the and the uh, you know the government of a, of a given denomination, church, or whatever, who decides they're not going to have communion with someone else because they don't understand it the same way and so on. But in the case of the, of the believer, it, it seems that, that, that this idea of the fire or, or of the, uh, the iron in the fire is what's going on with the believer. Yes. They're participating with Christ and it. That's right. It happens That's actually another application even of the word transelementation. It's used to cover that case. Yeah. It's what's going on with the believer. Yes. And as we talked about, I, th I think, in a previous interview, um, the irony of the fact that you're, you're taking the Lord's Supper actually is expressing in, in, that, in that participation in yes. Christ, yes. in his body and blood, regardless of how you interpret it, understand it, or describe it, or how your, your superiors do in the church, uh, is actually pointing to the unity that uh, that exists in spite of all of our to a large degree. There, there are around. people though who think when Jesus says, "Do this in remembrance of me," there's a kind of an established Protestant perception that this is a mental event. You know that as you are receiving mm, the bread yes. and wine, you're supposed to remember yes. something. So you're thinking about that. Yeah. As a it's actually a better translation is "Do this as my memorial." I don't have time to work this out, but it's like Passover. You know, the, the original Passover becomes present 
in the celebration of the Passover and, and the people who are celebrating here and now are in some sense incorporated into the original Passover. So the, the boundaries between past and present are uh, transcended in, in the celebration. The, the memorial... You're taking part in the deliverance that occurred yeah, originally. The enactment is the memorial. Oh. It's, not a, it's not a second mental event along with it. And the ecumenical minimum, you know, apart from all this theoretical work that I just outlined, the ecumenical minimum that has to be there if we're to overcome these divisions is we have to be able to say, regardless of how we get there, without crossing our fingers, that this is the body of Christ. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Uh, that, it, that it really is the case that this bread and this wine are the body and blood of Christ. And Luther uses the incarnational analogy. He says, just as we can point to this man and say, this man is the Lord, and we don't mean that his humanity is his deity, but would be by virtue of the union, this man is the Lord, or the Lord, uh, the man on the cross is God. You know, by virtue of the union, we, we say these things that would not otherwise be possible. By virtue of the relation, we can say this bread is the body of Christ because of that koinonia relation, because of that mutual indwelling, because of that uh, mystical union uh, accomplished not by the presiding minister, not by the priest, but by Christ himself in the power of the Spirit through the priest and with the congregation. Uh, that's the breakthrough that the Reformation needs in order to be able to say without crossing their fingers, this is the body of Christ, at least the Presbyterian. And of course, it's, it's a so what until someone partakes of it. Exactly, exactly. But the communion in the elements is what brings us into communion with uh, the living Christ himself. And I mean, he's not absent. There's actually this terrible, I, I hate this term that is sometimes used, the real absence of Christ, you know, real presence and real absence. I mean, there, there's no such thing as a real absence of Christ. You know, I mean, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. I mean, he's present in some sense, and where two or three are gathered together, which is probably a Eucharistic passage anyway, I am in the midst of you. I mean, there's no such thing as a real absence of Christ. And, and, but it, he's, yeah. he's present in this mode. He's, he's present under the forms mm -hmm. of his body and blood, this sacramental union uh, of uh, the body, the life-giving flesh with the bread and the wine. Uh, that's crucial. That's ancient. That's deep. That, that is not just a so what uh, kind of perception, that Christ is with us in this palpable way uh, that brings his uh, sacrificial death to us and him in his sacrificial significance so that we are uh, renewed and uh, nourished by our participation in what he did there and then. It becomes present to us sacramentally here and now so that we are, are given an active share in it by grace through faith. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.